This is Raheem Shabazz of Necessary Blackness Podcast, and I am here with Mr. Dan Moore, who is the executive of the Apex Museum, and we are standing in front of the Women in STEM exhibit, and we're going to go inside, and we're going to have a great and informative interview. Y'all stay tuned. (laughs) My name is Dan Moore, Sr., and I'm the founder and president of the Apex Museum, which is located in downtown Atlanta, Georgia. During the time when I started the Apex Museum, we faced a lot of challenges, one of which was people were asking who, who actually sanctioned this. And because I'm from Philadelphia, from the north, there was questions about the southerner coming down here to start a black history museum. But the reason it was founded is because I went to a, a banquet where they were honoring Dr. Benjamin Mays. Mm. And when I listened to all of the accolades given to him, my first question to myself was, why doesn't this city, of all the cities in the nation, not have a black history museum? So four months later, we, I started the Apex Museum. When we started, we initially had a, a space in my office, had an office in Buckhead, we had a space there for temporarily. And then Moss Brown College gave us the first floor of a building they had on Auburn, on uh, Ashby Street, at 171 Ashby Street. We operated out of there for a while. And then one of the board members located this building. It was in shambles at the time. It was built in 1910 as a school book depository. But then it was being used as a tire warehouse. It was in very poor shape. It would rain on the outside and pour on the inside, so it was really a challenge to get it fixed. But since 1988, we've been here at 135 Auburn Avenue in the historic district of the MLK Center. When we talk about reparations, of course we know there's been some discussion around that recently, uh, with June 19th. Um, My concern is several things. Number one, this has come up over and over again for a number of years, and we still don't seem to get it and get it right. When I heard the remarks by one of the senators talking about, well, we did our best, we had the Civil War, we had this proclamation, we had this um, thing passed, we have a black president. And for anybody to think that's part of reparations just shows what the mentality is of some of these persons who are quote, leading our country. When I think about reparations, I go back further than just what is due to us here in the the U.S. But we have to remember that we have not studied the white people's mindset, and so it's difficult for us to even answer some of these questions because we're not even understanding what kind of mindset they have. We have an exhibit here at the Apex called Africa, the Untold Story. And it talks about the colonization of Africa. And when you look back at history, and you see that Great Britain, a country that's about that big, uh, first of all, they call themselves Great Britain. So how do you, as a country that small, even refer to yourself as Great Britain, unless you yourself are in a mindset that you are great? And so during the... um, period of time when they were colonizing Africa, this small country became the second largest colonizer, not of a country, but of the entire continent of Africa. So that talks about the mindset. What is the kind of a mindset that says to someone, I'm going to come to this country because there's something here I want. I'm going to capture this country. I'm going to take care of all of the things that I need to take care of for my benefit. I'm going to subject these individuals, I'm going to change their mindset so they don't even like themselves, and then I can more easily control them. So until we get a handle on what the mindset is of white people, we're not going to go very much further when we talk about reparations. We look at even Haiti and how hated Haiti is and how Haiti had to actually pay reparations to France. Now here's a, here's a small country that was, in, it was enabled to do what it could to fight off the French and the Portuguese and, and the English. 
and as small as they were, they won those battles. And so Haiti is hated today because of what they did to, to ward off uh, the colonization of that country. Coming back to America, there's debate now, well, where does it go? Who's it go to? Who, who do we label? Who, who do we get? Or how do we pay people now what has happened 100 years ago? Well, first of all, we have to understand the repercussions of what happened over 100 years ago. It was not just the fact that it was slavery, but every generation since that time has had to deal with the effects of slavery. And although we built this country, we have to turn around and look and see that the persons who enslaved us are the ones who benefited from their enslavement of us since the beginning of this country. So when we talk about reparations, we have to talk very seriously about what is the best uh, formula that, that repairs the damage done to a whole race of people. Uh, it's not just about reparations and giving out dollars and cents to any, any and everybody. But we're looking at talking about where does the greatest impact come. And we have got to couple that with what's going on today, which is racism, which still exists, which is a part of the whole reason why we have to, we have to even talk about reparations. And so until we clean up some of these things, it's going to be very difficult for people to talk about meaningful answers and, and recommendations for reparations. Okay. We have a slave ship replica here. It's a Portuguese slave ship called the White Lion. Most of the time when you see slaves in a slave ship, it's an aerial view of them lying down. When you walk in and see this replica, you see these slaves in this ship lying down on their backs, chained together, 18 inches of space to deal with. It makes a totally different image and presentation. We've had folks come in here, see that, and walk out and say, I really cannot stand to see that. I've had children come in here and say, they did this to us, and we still survive. But more importantly, that stage it was only a portion of, a, of an exhibit. It's called Africa, the Untold Story. It was inspired by Asa Hilliard, who was a professor at one of the universities here. And what he said consistently is, whatever you do, Never let them begin our history with slavery. So we have an exhibit that takes you back thousands of years to ancient African civilizations so we can understand truly what Africa has given to world history, whether it's mathematics, whether it's medicine, whether it's architecture, whether it's farming. All of these things were developed in, in Africa thousands of years ago and stolen from other people as they landed on these shores. So we first of all talk about Africa as a continent and what it has given the world. It is the richest continent in the world and yet they refer to Africa as third world countries. It has all the minerals, all of the gold, all the silver, all the diamonds and all the things that we need almost always and that's why they put themselves in a position to make sure they control not just part of, but all of Africa. And the only two countries that remained independent was Liberia and Ethiopia. Liberia, of course, it was founded by ex-slaves from America, and then Ethiopia. Okay, so we're back, and this is Raheem Shabazz, and I am talking to... Dan Moore Sr., founder and president of the Apex Museum. And we are sitting right here at the Apex Museum, now, we were talking earlier, we talked about the starting of the Apex Museum, the need for it, and we also talked about uh, reparations. Yes. Right? Another hot topic that needs to be discussed is the curriculum in the schools. And we know that those that go to Afrocentric schools, they have a higher graduation rate their uh, GPA is much higher than those that go to traditional schools. How important is it is for a young male, young female of African American descent to have a curriculum that reflects their overall worldview? It's very critical because when you're looking at a history book, 
and all you see is people who don't look like you. You have no reason to believe you can do anything. Now, when I was in school, there were only two people in the history books. That was George Washington Carver and Booker T. Washington. So you look into a history book, and all the heroes, all the people who are applauded, are white. What incentive do I have as a young black person to believe I can do anything at all to make an impact on, on the country or on my own life? So I'm starting off with a negative view of myself. And I can't go very far in life if I have a negative view of who I am. Yeah, it's very important that you do see other individuals in our history books, because like you said, you only had two people that mm -hmm. you see, and most times than not, um, our history is relegated to slavery. And what I like to tell people is that our history doesn't begin with slavery. Slavery interrupted our history, and that our history goes back further than that. Um, and a lot of times, if we're not being taught about slavery, it, it begins with the uh, civil rights. Civil rights so we need to go back to ancient Egypt. We need to go back into the interiors of the mother continent. How important is that and when did that shape your worldview as far as the educational system? What was your educational upbringing like? Mm -hmm. Well, it certainly wasn't about, wasn't, wasn't about that. That's what you <laughs> But I had a father who was very, very much in tune with our history. Mm -hmm. So number one, he taught us pride. Whatever okay. we wanted to do, going to school, we had to be proud of who we were and what we were. When I came to Atlanta, I had the opportunity to look at the draft cards of World War I. And they're the only place in the country that has the original draft cards. I went into the archives, pulled up my father's draft card, and on the back of it, it said nationality, and he put down African. And they would tear the, the side of the card off to indicate it was a person of color. So he taught us to be proud when I was even a small child. But looking at today's society, the only thing we see is on, on television, for example, are the things that are negative about us. So some news director is sitting somewhere he or she may get 10 stories coming over their desk. They choose what's going to be aired. Mm -hmm. And almost always they're going to choose what is negative and not what is positive. So I'm coming up, I'm 15 years old, 12 years old, whatever I may be, and everything I see on television, everything I hear on the radio, that's negative, I see a black face attached to it. Mm -hmm. That starts shaping my world. I see people who, who have been successful. So my role models become people who have been successful economically, but sometimes they're doing more damage to my community than anybody else. Well, I'm very happy to be here in Atlanta, number one, and I'm glad that I am in, I am in the position I am in, because more than just history, we also help a lot of people uh, with their own dreams. We have helped at least 25 to 30 people start nonprofit organizations and get the 501c3. We have helped at least 25 people publish books, one of whom I always have to talk about because I saw her on television and I was very, very impressed with her testimony. And when she came here, she told me her story. She graduated from high school with 3.2 GPA and two basketball scholarships. And five months later, she was facing 135 years in jail. She had talked about uh, her life and how she had driven a car with someone. She, they got caught. She went to jail for several years. She came out, and being a convicted felon in Georgia, your life is just about over. She couldn't do anything. So she decided to take her own life, that her mother raised her daughter, and she went to meet uh, someone at a, at a salon. The lady talked to, talked to her for a minute, gave her a mustard seed, and said to her daughter, this is all you need. Her name is Desiree Lee. She came to my office in January, had her book completed, and had a book signing in March the same year. I watched her Facebook go from 1,000 to 7,000 within one year. She now has 50,000 followers and she has personally helped 
more than 300 people become published authors. The other young man that I helped, I was talking to his mother, helping his mother. He said to me, Mr. Moore, can I write a book? I said, sure you can. He went home and he wrote about six books in two weeks. His first book was entitled um, Extinct and Non-Extinct Animals and Their Survival Skills. His book is now on Amazon, seven years old. So we've had the privilege of working with people who have um, great ideas, great thought processes, wanting to help the community that we've, we've been able to help. In addition to just being a depository and a repository for black history. Well, the Apex Museum is really not right now in phase one of a two-phase project. But as we are in phase one, we encourage young people to come here especially to look at what we have now, which is an exhibit on black inventors. It will simply blow your mind when they look and see of all the inventions and patents that blacks have done and made over the years, including Michael Jackson's patent of what he called the anti-gravity shoe. Another exhibit on women in STEM and for young women to walk in here and see 16 photographs on the wall of people who look like them, who are involved in STEM programs, it encourages them to say, well, if she can do it, I can do it. But the phase two, we're going to build on a parking lot which we own next door to us. It's going to be a complete walk through history in Epcot Center fashion, beginning with ancient African civilizations. We're going to transport you back to ancient Africa and allow you to walk through history and understand and experience the greatness of this great continent, of this great people. We're on Facebook, we're Apex Museum. Apex stands for the African American Panoramic Experience. We invite you to come down. Necessary Blackness Podcast is independently owned and we do not accept sponsorship dollars from corporations. We are supported by the people such as yourself who know that in war, the first casualty is the truth. We are at war with racism and white supremacy. We must continue to tell the truth. Support us by purchasing your Necessary Blackness t-shirt by sending an email to necessaryblacknesspodcast at gmail.com.